For the fall semester, we've been continuing our theme, By Whom, For Whom, Designs for Belonging, where we consider accessibility, inclusion, and justice as they pertain to today's debates on design and technology. Our series asks, how can today's designers work to promote alternative methodologies and ways of life? We investigate design's historical and contemporary exclusions and invite distinguished speakers to share how their work considers a future of belonging. Let's switch to the next slide, please. Today, we're excited to welcome our first speaker of the fall semester, Liz Gerber from Northwestern University. Before we get to the talk, there are just a few reminders. Cart captioning is available for this talk and can be turned on in your Zoom interface. For any other access requests, please send an email to laurenartist at berkeley.edu. And today's talk will not be recorded. As always, there will be Q&A with our speaker immediately following the talk. We encourage you to ask questions as they come up throughout the talk using the Q&A function in Zoom. So send those questions in early and often and take a look at questions that have already been asked and uh, vote on those that you want to have answers. Uh, Professor Eric Palos and I will trade off sharing your questions following the talk. Oh, and I just saw, sorry, I got that wrong. Today's talk will be recorded. <laughs> Hard to get all the details right. Okay, uh, visit our Design Conversations homepage to register for future talks and watch previously recorded conversations that you may have missed. One more announcement. Next Saturday, we'd like to invite you to our open house as part of UC's, UC Berkeley's reunion and parents weekend at homecoming. This campus-wide event welcomes the broader community, alumni, students, and their families to visit campus and learn more about the opportunities and culture at UC Berkeley. We'll be hosting a makerspace open house where you can participate in laser cutting demos led by our student supervisors. You can tour the building, talk with students from our clubs, um, and learn more about our Master of Design program. Learn more about the event by visiting the prospective students page, which Meg will link in the chat. All right. Now for the main event, joining us today is Liz Gerber from Northwestern University, where she's a professor of mechanical engineering and communication studies and the co-founder and co-director of the Center for Human Computer Interaction and Design. The center's mission is to study, design, and develop the future of human computer interaction at home, work, and play. The center supports researchers working to discover new interaction paradigms that support a collaborative, equitable, and more sustainable society. Her work is, is situated at the intersection of design, social computing, and organizational behavior to understand the future of collaboration. Professor Gerber also is the faculty founder of Design for America, a network of social innovators and an idea incubator focused on complex design challenges and building a community of learners. She also co-directs the Delta Lab, whose mission is to create technology-based systems to enhance learning, collaboration, and performance. Liz has received many awards from the National Science Foundation, Microsoft, the Smithsonian, Adobe, and many others. And her work has been featured on NPR, Harvard Business Review, The Wall Street Journal, and Forbes, just to name a few. She received her uh, master's degree in product design and mechanical engineering and her PhD in management science and engineering from Stanford. Please join us in welcoming back to the Jacobs Institute, Liz Gerber. Thank you, Bjorn. What a friendly introduction. I am touched and honored um, by that. I'm just thrilled to be here today, honored to be sharing the stage with some fabulous folks that you've invited on previously from Dory Turnsdale to August de las Reyes, excuse me. Um, just a wonderful, wonderful host um, of speakers that you've had. So thank you, really honored by that. I'm gonna take a moment to get the slides up. Okay. Please let me know if you're having a hard time seeing anything. Excellent. So, like I said, what an incredible, um, incredible topic, how timely, obviously, and uh, it's a real honor to be here today sharing a few of my ideas. So I'm going to start with a question, uh, a simple question, perhaps, um, by show of hands, and hands may be digital or uh, in, the, in, the, in the chat, um, who's interested in making impact of, of some kind, any kind? 
Anybody? I'm going to guess that a good number of your hands are, are raised right now. Um, that's great. Impact is good. It means having an impact on somebody. It means having an effect. And as we know, there's many ways to make impact. We could have impact by building software, for example, or hardware that people use. We could start a company, maybe develop policy, many ways of having impact. Today, I want to talk about a very specific kind of impact, um, which I call social impact. And I am defining that as impact that is positively affects society. So just to get right off, I like to start with a concrete example. I'm going to show you an interview with a former student of mine, Aaron, um, and his work working with children who were sick um, to help improve their experience. So let's get right into that. My name is Aaron, and I love designing playful experiences for children who are ill. What I know from having human growth hormone deficiency as a child is it's really scary. No child should ever have to have that feeling. I've always loved tinkering and building. My fascination with robots really, really blossomed when I was in college. And actually through the project that ended up creating our company, Sproutel, I started observing families of children with type 1 diabetes. What we learned is that kids were acting out all of these medical procedures with their stuffed animals. We designed a robot, Jerry the Bear. This is Jerry the Bear. For children with diabetes that would exhibit the same symptoms as them. My blood sugar level is 149. A robot that they could care for that could be just like them. She has one right here. And I have one right here. Yeah, you do. While our initial insight was for children with diabetes, We've seen that the same thing holds true for children with cancer, and that's what inspired us to then create my special Aflac duck. The duck that we created for children also has cancer. A friend who's just like you, who's going through the same experiences as you, to provide comfort. Duck is singing. Yes. The duck is fully responsive to the child. It has sensors in its cheeks, down its back, and under its wings. As they pet it, as they cuddle with it, the duck is reacting. <laughs> It's very difficult for them to communicate their feelings. So we have a series of tokens that we developed that we call feeling cards. And each one has a different emoji on it. Happy, silly, scared, mad. And you can tap them right to the duck's chest, middle emote. <laughs> this is the sad card. It gives them a way to communicate to their caregivers that's less stressful than being asked, hey, how do you feel about getting chemo? using the app that the duck comes along with. They get to control when their duck receives chemotherapy treatments. You can also do things like give your duck a bath because it's really stressful for kids to get a sponge bath. We had a parent call us up and tell us that their child started to refer to their diabetes as a superpower. And that's the feeling that we want to give to every single child with illness. It was incredibly emotional to, to work with it, the kids. There was a little boy named Kyrie who, every time I would try to leave the room, he would grab my finger and he just like wouldn't let go. And through the time that we were testing, Kyrie's cancer actually went into remission. He finished treatment. <laughs> and that was just the best possible feeling that we could have had. Sorry. <laughs> September is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. We're rolling out ducks to kids. It's so cute. It's awesome. My hope is that this work inspires others, that it inspires big companies to change the way that they think about healthcare. Donald's got his foot bed on. That inspires other people who want to start companies about, hey, how can I change the way that I'm thinking about creating responsible technology, about creating technology that empowers people? My name is Aaron. Awesome. Uh, thanks for taking a moment to watch that with me. I can't get enough of watching that. Um, but the reason I showed it to you is I want to ask ourselves, why, why did I show it to you? In fact, what, what's the message I was trying to get across? And the message I want to share with you today is pretty simple. It's that connection is key. Connecting with others, helping them, in this case, alleviate discomfort and, in, and um, a lack of control is a really powerful way of making impact. And when we connect with others, we can create um, ideas together that, that people will use. We can find interesting problem areas to which to apply our technical expertise. And we can um, uh, develop new areas that we never even knew about. And to me, that is so absolutely exciting. So stepping back, Bjorn briefly explained who I was. Let me give you a little background of how I came to this um, thesis of connection is key and then illustrate that with some examples. So I'm a professor at Northwestern, 
And um, this is, uh, these are three of my students from the organization I started called Design for America. And we designed this uh, organization together about 12 years ago. Um, two of the students in that picture are engineering majors and one is a major in physics. And we were sitting on the floor of my office and we asked ourselves, how might we mobilize young people across the country to use their technical skills to make social impact? And frankly, we were tired of young people being ignored as problem solvers and being described as indifferent. Um, and frankly, of community expertise being ignored completely. My belief is that the best ideas, regardless of where they come from, should have a chance to change the world. So to build a healthy society, uh, we thought, how might we empower these young people to work with community members to prioritize social well-being over monetary gain? And we're deeply inspired by organizations of the past, such as the Peace Corps, who mobilized youth to support economic and social development abroad, starting in the 60s. Teach for America, who encouraged a new generation of uh, teachers in the US in the 90s, among many other organizations that has inspired us. So today, Design for America is a national network of thousands of voluntary students, mentors, community, build, uh, community members, industry partners who work together to use design to make social impact in their local community. And universities across the country host um, Design for America studios where these interdisciplinary teams work together to tackle grand challenges um, that they, they find meaningful such as pollution, literacy, environmental disasters, et cetera. So the interdisciplinary, how do these teams work? The teams get together and they reframe and scope challenges, working directly with community members, and then rapidly generate and test the ideas with the community members. And the belief, the fundamental belief of this practice is one that I think the Jacobs um, Institute very much believes, which is that the world fundamentally will be more intelligent when we are more inclusive. That's why we do this. So, and the goal then is to conclude, not when the semester is over, but rather when projects are, are implemented in a sustainable way. So here's a concrete example. Um, this is a story from Design for America's Matt Wilcox, who watched his grandmother after she experienced a fall in her home. And so not only did she have to experience this long hospital stay and physical therapy, also observed that she had this long lasting emotional trauma, if you will. He described it, he said, well, it made it feel like she was getting old. She all of a sudden felt old and she was depressed and she was losing confidence in her ability um, to be independent. So upset by this experience, Matt was determined to reduce elderly falls um, among adults in this case, so they could remain in their home and remain independent. So Matt teamed up with a local senior living community and quickly learned his grandma was, grandmother was not alone. Um, half, in fact, in assisted living facilities, half of all um, relevant uh, residents rather fall every year. And um, it causes many emergency visits, rooms, emotional stress um, and injury, quite frankly, for older adults. So what he also learned is that 40% of these um, falls happen at night and they happen at night when there's less staff on hand and um, residents can't see in, in the low light. And so Matt and his teammates worked with this community to develop this ultra thin bed sensor that an easy to install lighting system. Um, so when a resident gets out of bed, the lights automatically activate, illuminate pathways to nighttime destinations such as the restroom. And then the restroom, excuse me, the resident returns to the bed and the lights go off. So it doesn't require a wearable device. Um, you don't have to remember to switch it on at night. You don't lose it. It's just absolutely, it's just there. And so, um, this was just a really beautiful and elegant solution that you know plays off of many of the things we've seen in air, you know, airlines when you at when it's dark in an air in a airplane, a path illuminates. It makes sense. Um, what's interesting about this space is um, nobody had really been looking in this space in terms of, from an innovation perspective. Um, and this Fortune magazine um, actually magazine actually ended up featuring Matt and Luna Lights, the name of his company, for. Um, thinking about a new market that no tech vendor was um, addressing at the time. Um, so tech supported caregiving for rapidly aging population, huge and interesting area that came um, from Matt's experience with his grandmother. So that's just one example of the many hundreds of projects that Design for America students work on um, to make social impact in their local community. 
And you may be asking, well, how do they do it? What's the process? And I decided to frame this talk around um, and explain the process by four questions that I'm constantly asked about what they do and how they do it. So first question is pretty important. How do I make sure I'm working on an important problem? Next is how do I make sure I'm solving the right problem? How do I scope the problem? How do I get it so it's manageable? And how do I increase the likelihood that the whatever we design together will, will actually work and um, sustainably work in the long term? So I'm going to share a few stories um, that uh, illustrate how we've addressed these questions um, at Design for America. So take them one at a time. Um, the first one is, how do I make sure I'm working on an important social problem? And this seems like such a simple, it's an oversimplified solution, but um, start reading the news. So we're busy people, um, but as uh, people who care about making me meaningful change in the world, we need to commit time to understanding the grand challenges that society is facing. Um, we can read the local news, the national news, global news. Um, we may follow social media um, of thoughtful people who are reflecting on some of these grand challenges, but we stay informed. Um, and we, we, uh, we do this because we're passionate about understanding what's not working um, in our community and why is it not working? So of course, that's a very distant answer. Uh, reading the news um, and following online conversation is too remote from the lived experience of these challenges. The next, that's just the entree. The next step and most important is really to work with the community um, to get the unmediated reactions and experiences of those directly affected. So let's consider an, a concrete example there. So here's an example. There was a junior named Ellen Sue who was reading about scoliosis having a dangerous and costly effect um, on children. And uh, they had to have these surgeries, um, which could have been prevented by wearing these plastic uh, back braces. Um, she could have just read that and moved on, but instead she was kind of, she became interested in this problem. And she asked herself, what can I do about it? How can I possibly influence this? And so she reached out to her classmate Levi, um, who had suffered from scoliosis as a kid to learn more. And then together they reached out to more people um, who had also experienced to, to learn even more and created a community around this. And with this diverse team, Ellen and Levi um, built what you see on the screen. And this is um, a Bluetooth event uh, device rather called Cinch. It can be retrofitted to any back brace on the market and connects to software that monitors for prop proper brace fit. And, um, and usage. And what's neat is that Cinch, the Cinch product rewards kids with frequent use, kids often don't wanna use these, and provides actually a social support for all the kids using them. And they're currently, um, they're, they've done some testing in New York Presbyterian Hospital with a couple hundred kids, and now they're in clinical trials to establish what the clear, clear guidelines are for the correct strap tension. Um, but what I love about this is, is that again, this is a real project actually happening that started from this, this um, from Ellen reading the newspaper and then connecting with the community. And this is very consistent with what we know from the innovation literature is that people who stay informed about the world um, and especially about many different domains actually are very successful because they're able to connect the dots and bring different things together. So for example, Ellen and Levi use sensor technology they were aware of because of their their technical training to um, help kids with a scoliosis. But to be able to do this, they had to know about both domains and bring those together. So I'm gonna do a, a little activity with us. I'm going to post a few news articles that I we were posted today or this, this week. And I'm going to invite you to think for a moment to think about how might the work that you're doing right now, your, your specialty, your area, positively influence these challenges and the community affected by these challenges. So here's one that's near and dear to the Berkeley, Berkeley area. Um, the wildfires are emitting planet warming carbon dioxide. They, they're emitted more this summer than they've ever admitted before. So I want you to ask yourself, how might the technology you're, you're designing, the, the work that you're doing possibly make a positive impact on this issue? Do you know anybody that's directly affected by this phenomenon? What do you think it feels like to be one of those people 
to be a central player in this news item, this news. Here's another one that is deeply concerning to me. It's based in New York, but I think it's happening in many different places. Subscribing now, hospitals are worried they're not gonna have enough staff to run hospitals next Monday. And this, this actually, um, because of the, the vaccine, this actually happened. I, my father was um, not admitted to the hospital when he needed to be because they did not have enough staff. So this is near and dear to my health. Um, so I wanna ask you, how might the technology you're developing make a positive impact in staff shortages? Do you know anybody who's personally affected by this? And a last one, also very upsetting. Um, there was yet another killing at a grocery store. This one was in Tennessee. Um, so let's ask ourselves, how might the technology we're developing make a positive impact on this issue? Again, do we know anybody that was directly affected by this shooting or any other shooting that's happened in the past? And what do you think it feels like to be a grocery worker if this becomes the new norm? And how might we understand that better and support that community. So when we're reading the news, which can be upsetting, um, I want to encourage us to start to think about potential paths to impact. Um, and I want to encourage you, instead of choosing to look away, which um, can, can be convenient, challenge yourself. Ask yourself, how can what I'm doing right now possibly help this situation? And I'm gonna encourage you to use your heart to connect with these ideas as much as your head. Um, it's very important to do that. So I encourage you to realize new opportunities for impact that you might not necessarily think about. The second question that I'm often asked is, well, how do you make sure you're solving the right problem? And just to be clear, there are many right problems. Um, I do not think there is one single right problem, but I certainly believe there are <laughs> many wrong problems. So how do you solve one of the many right problems? And the answer is that we follow is pretty simple. It's um, getting to the root cause. So the way that we get to the root cause is by using a technique called the five whys. Perhaps you've heard about it. It's an interrogative um, technique and it's used to explore the cause and effect relationships of a challenge. So the goal is to discover the root cause of a problem by repeating the question why. And the answer forms the basis of the next question. So. The answer to why may suggest a broken process or behavior that needs to be changed. So what does this really look like? Let me give you a very simple example. The car is not running. Here was a dead car. Well, why? Well, the battery's dead. Well, why? The alternator is not working. Well, why? The alternator belt is broken. Well, why? <laughs> the alternator belt was old and well beyond its useful service life. Well, why was that? Well, the vehicle was not maintained according to the recommended service schedule. Ah, this is the root cause of this car not running. So people often ask me, they're, do I need five whys? No, sometimes you might just need three. Sometimes you might need seven. Um, but the goal really is to get to the fundamental and the core broken process or behavior that's, that's, not, that's not working. And, um, What's lovely about this method, and we use it too, too infrequently, is that we have to get to know a problem really deeply um, instead of just working at a surface level and developing solutions to surface level problems. If that happens, we'll continue to, to be addressing these problems, um, these surface level problems. So let me give you an example of how this turned out in Design for America. Um, it's a project that was related to reducing hospital acquired infections that can lead to death. So just <laughs> straight up, this is an upsetting problem to me because think, think about this, you can show up at a hospital being wanting to be treated for one condition and then die from an infection that you got only because you were at the hospital. And what's interesting to me is that this problem happens at all hospitals. This is not just at is that all hospitals with many resources and hospitals with few resources. And so this is, a, this is a systemic problem. And so this team started by asking, well, why do the infections even happen, right? Um, and one reason they learned is that um, people don't wash their hands. 
Yes, even, even today, people don't wash their hands. And um, they started doing some research around this and they learned from some work based on that World Health Organization that when you're at the bedside of a patient, um, there's five critical moments for hand hygiene um, in which you should wash your hands at all these different moments. Um, and honestly, most of these moments are ignored. Um, I don't know, the last time I was in the hospital, I'm pretty certain that I was, my care provider did not um, attend to all five of these. And um, they were re the team got really interested in this dilemma. Well, why, how is it that we design solutions to this? Um, but they wanted to slow down for a moment and say, well, wait, why aren't, we know this, this is an answer to why, um, how we can prevent hand hygiene or uh, hospital acquired infections, but why aren't people doing it? And so digging past the surface ideas of why people aren't doing it, um, they met up with doctors and, and nurses and um, spent some time with them, observing them. And they learned that these doctors and nurses are super passionate about patient health. That's why they're, that's why they're in the field that they're, um, that they're in. Um, but what is happening is they're aware of the importance of hand hygiene, but they're also incredibly committed to having and keeping a connection with the patient during the little time that they have in the room with them. So sometimes they choose to keep the connection rather than turn their back to wash their hands when they might need to. So during this over, um, they, they did many overnight visits and they started to realize that one of the challenges is that the hand sanitation, whether it be sinks or hand sanitation is not right on the um, care provider, it's somewhere else and they have to move away from the patient bedside to, to wash their hands. So that insight combined with a fortuitous trip to, uh, to the Lake Michigan beach um, that evening uh, when a team member stood up and he had sand on his hands and he did what, what we learned to do as children. He wiped his hands off on his um, pants. Um, he asked himself, well, why can't hand sanitation be just as easy as wiping sand off your pants, washing your hands on your, on your shirt? So the team worked closely with this hospital um, to try and figure out a more accessible hand hygiene system to minimize distractions um, and interactions that the caregiver would have with a patient. Um, and what you'll see here circled on the slide is a, just a little personal hand hygiene device that literally is on, on the person. Um, and this very simple system allowed caregivers to clean their hands and maintain eye contact with the patient when they were in the room with them. And they have done some studies and found some really amazing results, 64% improvement um, in adherence to desired hand hygiene results just by merely having, having this, um, this opportunity, this hand sanitation right on, on you. So um, to sum up that one, at Design for America, we, if we wanna have impact, but we don't get to the root cause, we risk the following. We can be blindsided by our assumptions of what, what is happening. We can be solving the wrong problem or a superficial problem. We can be developing solutions that don't help at all. Um, and again, missing new opportunities for impact. So but if we wanna ask why early and often, uh, we can really expand the, the challenges and the depth um, of the challenges that we're exploring to make more reliably make impact. On to the third question. So um, how do I scope the problem? So once you have the root cause, how do you scope a problem in a way that's tractable? And um, this, the way we do it is, is um, quite simply trying to think about reframing these often massive social issues in a series of small, personal and solvable problems. What do I mean by that? Let me give an example. Um, this, is, this is an example uh, that is also, have, when I have young kids and it's very personal to me as well. Um, this team learned that 30 to 40% of kids in the US need glasses to read, to learn, but many don't wear glasses. Um, and that makes learning to read very difficult. So college sophomore Nathan uh, could have been overwhelmed by the scale of this problem. 30, 40% of kids in the US need glasses and they're not, they're not wearing them. Um, but instead he reflected and said, well, what can, what can he do, um, do about it? And he reflected on his own personal experience um, when he was in the third grade and he was bullied for wearing glasses. 
Um, and he often wouldn't wear his glasses to school because he, even though he needed, he knew he needed them to see clearly, um, but he was being made fun of and uh, he didn't, he didn't want to wear them. So that was his personal experience. He teamed up with a classmate, Sophia, and um, together they wanted to ask, how could they just make a small difference? What's the slightest difference they could make for kids who didn't want to wear glasses um, and were missing out on learning opportunities? So again, working with the community, reached out to a local community elementary school teacher um, who gave them some great insight and said, you know, the kids feel really empowered when they can customize things like their notebooks or backpacks to match their personality. And so Nathan and Sophia wondered, well, what if we could empower children um, with newly prescribed glasses to get excited by personalizing them in some way? So it's small, went from 30 to 40% of kids don't wear glasses to like, how could we just tackle this, this smaller little, smaller little piece of it? And so they built um, a, a product called Pair Eyewear. Um, and this is basically a pretty simple product. Kids can um, snap on these magnetic frames with different colors and product uh, patterns rather. Um, and kids, turns out, enjoy wearing them. They express their personality um, and uh, kids then can read. And additionally, not only were they creative with the product, but the business model. Um, for every pair they sell, they donate a pair of um, a glasses to kids who can't uh, afford prescription eyewear. So this a process that they took is very consistent with a theory of small wins that I love, which is um, Carl White posited that often the massive scale of social problems precludes us from taking action because they're just so big. It's just absolutely too big. So what we need to do is we need to reformulate the large problems into small problems so it can feel more manageable. Um, and when we manage, when we, when we create these smaller problems, it's, we feel like we can take action. We can build up a track record of success by working on these smaller problems that together um, make something grand. And, um, and what I love about this is that what Nathan did was he looked at it from his personal point of view. What was his personal experience with this and how could he start by breaking down the problem with, with his personal point of view? So um, what I love also about this project is that it really emphasizes the importance of not just working with um, the team, but working directly with the community. They ended up, uh, <laughs> having a wonderful uh, group of kids with whom they were working. They worked with other, um, other teachers, other practitioners, and the diversity of the team was absolutely critical for them to make this, make this work. Um, so in this process, the reason it was so important is they had to reach out and talk to all these different people. They had to understand um, if their nascent ideas were were um, were good. They didn't, but what they didn't do is they didn't hide and wait to get it perfect. They really went out constantly with prototypes, um, and effectively they set up shop, if you will, in the community in which they were working, so they could really immerse themselves in um, in the in the context and work directly with these kids who would tell them quite honestly if something if they liked something or they did. Um, and so understanding the context for which we're designing is is just absolutely. Um, absolutely critical for, for making impact and working directly with people with lived experiences who understand what's going on. So fourth question, oversimplified, how do I make sure the solution will work? So to increase the likelihood that a solution will work, we absolutely need to work in context and we need to get regular feedback and get help from people who know things that we don't. So it's absolutely critical. Not only do we make the problem social and personally meaningful to us, but we make it a social, social process. Problems worth solving are rarely in a single domain. Um, any one of us is likely, none of us is likely to have enough expertise to solve a single complex problem. Um, so you might have uh, you might have expertise, for example, in machine learning um, with sensor input, but realize the solution may not work um, unless you have other expertise. So you collaborate with other people who have this expertise to get it built um, and designed effectively. So here's an illustration. Um, the hand hygiene case I was sharing earlier, a um, few years later after developing that, that product, the, the team was meeting with a hospital administrator and they noticed that they had attached one of their um, ID tags, which was to be on a piece of 
uh, what was to be on the hand sanitation um, equipment, they had attached it to a different piece of equipment in the hospital. And they asked, oh, why, why did you take this ID tag and effectively put it on something else? And the nurse said, oh, well, because I need to be able to find the equipment when I needed it. Um, and that wasn't the initial idea behind the tag, but the nurse had done what he needed to do to make it useful. And so as a consequence of having this conversation, um, the two design, the design team worked with the purchasing department to then provide a new, create, come up with a new tracking service that not only tracked the hand hygiene equipment, but also the location of a lot of medical equipment, which it turns out is a massive, massive challenge of medical equipment getting lost in, in hospitals, especially when you need it emergent, uh, immediately. And the team would have never thought of this solution nor even tried to attempt to come up with a solution um, if they hadn't been in the hospital, seeing how their other idea was, was working out or not working out. And so by working within the community, they were getting this regular feedback, what was working and not was, what was not working and also getting inspiration for new ideas of how to help. So in summary, the four questions I'm asked, frequently asked um, about making social impact are as follows. Um, I gave you some ideas about how to address them, but I wanna be really honest that there's also challenges here. It's not all straightforward. So here's just some of the challenges. The work I described can take a lot of time. It can be uncomfortable. It doesn't always require technology. And if you've got a technology you wanna use, you might not actually end up using it. It often requires working with large teams who have very different opinions. Um, it can be really uncomfortable, like looking at those articles and feeling like how in the world are we gonna address these massive challenges when we don't have working solutions to them. Um, it can be uncomfortable in the five whys exercise, working with community members and asking five whys, why isn't this working, why isn't this working, when sometimes people don't even know the root cause. It can be uncomfortable because by asking these questions, you reveal your biases. We all come into these problems with biases and all our approaches always have biases. And this is a very vulnerable and, and um, open, it's a collaborative process in which you reveal what your biases might be. Uh, it can be really uncomfortable because it can involve committing yourself to a, to a community and um, committing yourself to helping um, and not, not knowing quite sure how you're going to help. Um, and the other one that often happens and is really very salient to me is you can't necessarily foresee negative consequences for what you may design. Um, but by being in the community and being constantly engaged with the community, you can see if and when negative consequences first appear and address them immediately. So much of the technology we design won't immediately solve important social problems. But again, the, the path eventually to impact should be clear. Um, and some of the technology we design for a particular social problem won't have, end up solving the original problem for reasons unforeseeable at the time that can likely, um, and asking five whys, again, can't always mean the technology. Uh, sorry, asking five whys, the answer is not always technology. So let me get really concrete as to what I mean by this with an example. So this is a, a project done by um, a, a manufacturing and engineering major named Charles. Um, who wanted to take on bike safety in Chicago. And he learned that while mot motorist um, car accidents were decreasing, bike bicyclist accidents um, were increasing. And so at first, they, being technologists, they wanted to see how could they use sensors to warn bicycles of approaching cars and cars of approaching bicycles. Um, but through their work with the, the local community, um, they learned that actually one of the root causes of bike accidents, accidents, excuse me, was was miscommunication between bicycles, bicyclists, and and, and drivers. And so their solution was not the sensor solution, but rather to create a sign, like a, a concrete sign, to remind bicyclists of how to signal their direction, and to remind all the road users, cars including, of what the signs mean. So. Well, the, the initial evidence of this, this is, is in our hometown here, suggests that these signs are in fact decreasing the number of bicycle accidents. Um, this, this solution they came up with is not uh, being, it's not a radically technical solution. Um, 
And the Charles thought started off by thinking he was likely to have a technical solution. So if the best solution is not technical, should we still design it because we know it could have impact? I would argue yes. I believe it's imperative to be honest and humble when we come across cases when technology isn't the best solution. And we need to be ready to consider a range of technologies and types of designs that aim to improve the solution, whether they're the technology we came in and we thought we'd be using or not. Um, and we need to really think about um, how the priorities of our particular discipline, whatever it is, are shaping the problems that we see as worth solving. To me, this is a case study of the problem he thought was we're solving required sensors and it didn't, they required a sign. So what does this all mean? Um, to make social impact, I want to argue that we need to connect more to grand social challenges. We need to dig deeper to get the root cause to understand actually what's going on. And we need to make it more personal. We need to make problem solving um, more personal. And at the same time, we need to reach out more broadly and engage um, all sorts of people um, in the problem solving process. So just to be clear, connecting with others doesn't mean sacrificing um, your, uh, your own interests. It just means about learning what challenges are important to a community. Um, and we, we should and can be exactly who we are. We should bring our love of technology or sensors or machine learning or whatever it is. Um, but, we, but we also need to be open to what and we need to be open to what the community is, um, is, is doing and engaged with. And so I'm gonna leave with some calls to action. So to the designers listening, um, I'm going to encourage you that opportunities, look for opportunities for application in your world that may be in plain sight, look for work that's meaningful and um, look, for, um, look for inspiration. And to the teachers and managers, um, who might consider fostering these practices, um, I want to encourage you to know that I've been blown away by young technologists who are increasingly looking to uh, work with their communities to design and, and implement solutions. So, so we're, let's respond to that. Let's be, let's be helpful. Um, and so I'm going to end um, with this question, which is, if what we build effectively is an expression of our values, is the work that we're doing, reflecting our deepest held values about society. And when I come back next, what will be the story of impact that you will share with us? Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Liz. Yeah. Um, we will begin our Q&A now. Uh, we already have a number of questions in there. For everyone in the audience, if you haven't yet shared a question that's on your mind, please do so now. Uh, Eric and I will now take turns uh, reading, reading some questions. Um, okay. The most upvoted question is from Georges, who asked, the solutions mentioned seem to address problems in a Western way, with resources and costs of the solution being available only in specific places of the world. Mm -hmm. At which phase in the development process do we pivot and redesign the solution to be more widely accessible, cost-wise access, et cetera? So the question is spot on, the observation is spot on. You are right, these solutions um, were developed in the, the United States. They, they were, that's where they were developed. Um, and so the question you asked is, at what point do we pivot and develop them in different ways with less resources? Um, so I guess the first thing I would ask about that is, I don't know that I wanna presume that these solutions will work in places that have fewer resources. So I wouldn't think about just picking this up and redesigning it for less resourced communities and then plopping it in, that would be, um, irresponsible and uh, very presumptuous that this would work. So instead, I would start with a clean slate and I would um, work directly with those communities to find out what their challenges are. So um, the, uh, the, the, every solution we design is contextual and to be sure we can transfer solutions from one place to another, but we're never completely transferring them. 
we're, we're transferring ideas and bits of them, um, but it is, um, yeah, it's irresponsible to, to take one thing from one context and put it in another, I guess is my short answer for you. So don't do it, <laughs> that's my suggestion. <laughs> Find out what is happening in that community um, and what resources are available and what resources are not available and design, design within that context. Thank you, Eric. Great, yeah, thank you, Liz. Um, so uh, we had a question on this sort of idea of, you know, when social practice, you're basically often challenged to maintain engagement and avoid these kind of parachute in and design and, and, and move yourself. Uh, yep. Vivek Rao asks, asks this uh, much more poignantly. He says, thank you for a wonderful talk, Professor Gerber. These are really inspiring examples of innovation with impact. One of the recent critiques of human-centered design and design thinking approaches applied to societal cha challenges has been that even acting empathetically, designers have to leave at some point and may leave a community to engage with a solution that may not have uh, a, they say might not have a stake in. How do you yeah. balance the time scale of the student engagement years of months uh, in an undergrad or grad program with the scale and sustainability of engagement required to execute this even on small wins? And what advice would you have to students and leaders and researchers and faculty to navigate this given and constraints of academia, these timescales? Ah, oh, that is a brilliant question. Um, my short answer is let's blow up the timescales of academia because they do not work for uh, the real world. I mean, that's, I say that a little facetiously, but this idea that we can tackle problems in a semester is a fallacy, um, that we can even tackle problems in, a four-year undergraduate experience is a fallacy. Um, we need to rethink that as a um, just fundamentally rethink. I think it's a it's a again an irresponsible practice of of giving students that idea that they can they that can be done. Um, so much needs to be happened. I described it very simply here, but the um, critical time is spent developing relationships with people, and not just for understanding, but for trust. And then you, you hang around for the long, it's a long game. You don't drop it in and, and take off. You're around um, when and if it breaks, it will break, I guarantee you. Um, so it's a lifelong, I see this more of as a lifelong practice rather than, um, a, than a course is, is my short answer for you. So I think it's a fallacy. And I think um, as educators, we do our students a disservice by, by suggesting that we can solve anything in a semester. It, you cannot. Yeah, Nor can great. You the relationship. time skills are very challenging. <laughs> just, the time skills are, um, are wrong, but I think we, but I think, um, but we're propagating these time skills. Like we are, you know, we are complicit as faculty in saying this, um, this is possible. And I think we need to take ownership for that. Um, we can't, we can't possibly do that. Um, Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. No. No. I. I. I'm, I'm seeing this as a homework assignment to myself as well. So uh, I'm picking that up. Thank you. Uh, let me hand it back to Bjorn. Yeah. So uh, the question. Uh, next. Next question comes from uh, Faeze, uh, who asks, "Can we? Who asks? Can we have a DFA studio at UC Berkeley? There are 35 campuses, but not one on our campus. I actually have a, an answer to that. Um, answer." Pre Pre-pandemic, we had a yeah. chapter on yeah. campus. Um, I don't know um, what the latest state is, but if you go to dfa.berkeley.edu, you can find all the student organizers of that chapter. And I think they would love to hear from you if you want to get yeah. involved and uh, help grow the, the local community. So- It's currently, um, it is currently in, um, uh, it's dormant. That's what we, that's what we call it, it's dormant. Um, and sure, it's it's ready for re reinvigoration, and um, I'll come out and meet you when you when you start it up. Great. Again. So, uh, love your enthusiasm, um, Faze, for with that question, and you should absolutely get involved and help make it happen. And you have an incredible community with uh, Professor Hartman and Paulos and others uh, at your community. Uh, you know, incredible community, incredible supportive community. Eric, next question. Great, oh. perfect, yes, thank you. 
Um, so <laughs> another question uh, was uh, also about kind of adoption. There was the one that Vivek asked about how to like stay with the community. And this other one is uh, a little bit about how to deal with other constraints and look for a kind of broader kind of lower cost solutions perhaps that are yeah. more broad. So Frank asks, uh, I feel like some of the larger barriers to the broad uh, to the broader use of design for inclusion are the operating costs and startup costs of developing anything at scale. How can one design things that make societal impact at scale without the constraint of profitability? And what have you found the relationship between profitability and designing for your social for social impact to be? I think we all want that social impact, but we also they're not all free so thinking about other ways to scale things at lower costs or yeah no they're they're certainly not all free and no matter what you design um whether it be for social impact or for uh for any reason needs to be financially uh sustainable like everything costs money and takes resources in some way or another um and so you need to while simultaneously developing the solution if you will that in, you also need to be developing the infrastructure to make it sustainable. And so um, typically that happens, the way I've seen it most su successfully happen is working with um, existing entities, whether they be for-profit or non-profit that have a stake in that challenge and are eager to put resources towards it. So for example, with the bicyclists, um, the safety project, they were working with the transportation unit in the city who had resources and were invested in doing this kind of work. Um, uh, every project needs a sustainable funding stream in some way. It doesn't necessarily mean that the consumer is going to pay for it. There may be another person, a customer, who's paying for it so the consumer can have it for free. But the, the, the recognizing that all solutions to be sustainable do have to have some sustainable or some economic model behind them. Somebody needs to be paying the resources or, or sharing. There could be an exchange of resources, for example. There's many different ways of thinking about um, markets. Um, they're not all financially based, but there certainly ha there has to be a market value and there has to be some um, somebody paying or supporting it to happen. There's there's no way there's no way around that. And I think that some of the um, I've seen really brilliant and beautiful ideas die um, because somebody didn't think about the, the financial infrastructure upon which they were going to sit and be sustainable in the long run. And so every idea I, I look at now, I think, okay, this is lovely. This might work in the here and now, but what's it going to look like 10 years from now when that grant is gone or the, the leader who is the sole advocate of that solution is gone? Like what, what, how are we designing for systems that actually, that actually last? Um, and it's, those are hard questions. Those are really hard questions to ask. Um, but that's the only way that, that ideas um, uh, maintain, have a future effectively. Yeah, I think you're pointing out that designing for impact, it's very challenging and there's a lot of things that need to be thought through quite thoroughly. So I appreciate a lot that perspective. Of um, yeah, business, like to, oh, sorry. Business, no, just business modeling. I think, you know, I think as designers, sometimes we think I don't need to understand business models. Oh, absolutely. You need to understand business models. That is, that is critical for understanding how social impact stays, stays around and makes impact. So Business, understand business models, understand how they work. More homework assignments, I appreciate More it. homework <laughs> assignments. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna hand it back to Bjorn. Yeah, we have hey, one, one last question here from yeah. Jessica, who says, thank you for your talk, Professor Gerber. As solution scale, I assume the creators need to balance input from more diverse stakeholders, for example, for cultural differences, um, yeah. with staying focused on the right problem. How can companies scale and stay focused at the same time? Oh boy. <laughs> How do you scale and stay focused? My short answer, given the limited time we have, is that you um, uh, embed yourself in the, the many different places in which you and become part of the communities or engage people in those communities um, so that they can help focus you. Um, and then you're more of a networked um, organization uh, with different nodes developing the ideas and sharing, basically sharing best practices um, across the network. So. It's a decentralized um, model um, and you have to be prepared in that decentralized model for, um, for different ideas to progress in different ways and different, there's not as much, uh, you have to be 
you have to allow more freedom. There's not as much like, it's not top down, everybody do this. Um, it's a coordinate, it's more of a coordination um, problem and an exchange, it's important to exchange best practices among them. So I, that's my, my short answer is you can't do it from central. <laughs> uh, it's not, I don't think it's possible to scale um, top down. It, I think best scaled through a network approach. All right, well, we're coming to the end of our time here. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank you again for spending your time with us and also for everyone for attending and all the engaging questions you've asked. Um, have a lovely weekend, everyone, and we'll see you in the future for the next Design Conversations talk. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.